Um, so let's start with uh, the basics, Michael. Who was Du Fu? Uh, when and where did he live? Well, um, I know you're, you are also interested in these wider questions that you mentioned at the beginning, Pete, which is about our knowledge of China in, in the West. And um, uh, actually, I was reading a thing that Steve Tsang wrote in the, in the Sunday Times not long ago, and he said our knowledge of China and Chinese civilization in the West is kind of woefully ignorant. And, and, and so one prefaces, and it's nobody's fault, it's just the way that it works here. And so these great figures like Du Fu, who is um, in the Eastern world, is as great a figure as, if not more so, than Shakespeare or Dante, because he's, he's part of the, the creation of the value system of, of China, if you like, the traditional value system. We don't know about them here. And, and the tradition of poetry in China is the oldest living tradition of poetry in the world. The Book of Songs, the great anthology of poems about love and war and, uh, and so on, and work. Uh, the oldest bits of that are older than the Iliad and the Odyssey. So this is a very great poetic tradition of, at the top of which many people see Du Fu as being, well, you know, along with Li Bai and one or two of his contemporaries, the greatest. And, and that's partly because Chinese people tend to think of Tang, the Tang Dynasty, so 600 to 900, as being the great period of Chinese history. Um, I can vouch for that myself, because I once went with a film crew and did a Vox Pops in a big shopping mall in Shanghai. And uh, for about an hour or so, I, I just asked ordinary Chinese people, what's your favorite period of history? And their answer was, the Tang Dynasty. And uh, you ask them why, and they said, well, um, the culture was so brilliant. And it was when China went out to the world and the world came to China. But most of all, the poetry. So poetry is absolutely crucial. And, and Chinese people view the poets as kind of truth tellers. You can say things in poetry that you can't say in political writing, even today. You may have seen that um, news stories recently about the blank paper protests, where people are standing in, not just in Hong Kong, but in Beijing and Shanghai, holding up blank sheets of paper can't get arrested for a blank sheet of paper. But the government got so freaked out about that that they, that, you know, they apparently even major stationers were told not to stock A4. You mm. know. But along with the blank sheets of paper were quotes from Du Fu. Du Fu lived in the 8th century. Uh, golden age of uh, culture, art and everything else in China. Um, born in 712. So it's the, the age of Beowulf in Britain, if I can put it that way. Um, although, of course, it's on a level of sophistication which is far beyond anything that was happening in, in our world. And, and he was born into the uh, you know, upper classes, really. And he, he hoped and believed he would pass the imperial examinations and become a top bureaucrat, um, advise the emperor, write poetry, um, be, be counted on for his great advi advice in how to run the empire in a just way and all the rest. But uh, even though he already was recognized as a poet by the time he was in his teens, so he could see how brilliant he was, everything came crashing down. He failed his examinations. He failed them a second time. He wandered, um, at times directionless got a minor job as a bureaucrat and got married, but on, on the edge of, you know, going nowhere. And then a series of cataclysms hit China with uh, natural disasters, the capital was flooded, famine struck, uh, devastating for the, for, the, for the country. And then followed by one of the most cataclysmic wars in Chinese history in which uh, 30 million people vanished from the censuses of the Tang Dynasty from the beginning to the end of the war over those eight years. So they, in those eight years, 30 million people vanished from the censuses, either killed, died of starvation, or driven into internal migration. And Du Fu's life is, is, is conditioned by that. 
he, I, I put it in the book, he learns what, when Shakespeare's King Lear talks about what it is to be a naked, unaccommodated man, that is what Dufu in the end came down to. Um, uh, he understood what it was like to be a poor person in the very depths of society. And his greatest work was in response to those disasters. It's the contrast between the golden age and the, and the disasters that, that create his greatest work. And he curates his own, even though he died in obscurity, he creates his own, uh, um, curates his own work. And there's very little before the war. It's as if he realized that he found his voice in the war. Can I read a, read a yes, poem from the war? Yes, I was going to ask you to read yeah. some poems. I mean, I should probably read you a little bit of the... I mean, the book is a, is a travelogue. You know, I follow in his footsteps, staying in two-bit hotels in Gong Yi and, and all the rest, but we'll come to that later. This, is, this gives you an idea of, uh, of what's happened. The capital is um, devastated by floods and famine. 60 days of floods. Uh, huge numbers of people are dying of starvation. Food supplies broken down. And he's sent his family out to a village in the hinterland hoping they'll be safe there. And at the first opportunity to get a, a moment off from his minor civil service job, he starts off at midnight to try and reach the family and see what's happened. <laughs> this, this is, um, uh, I've had to edit it because it's uh, a hundred line poem, but this is it. At the year's ending, a bitter wind scouring the high ridges, I set out a lone traveler at midnight my fingers too cold to tie my broken belt. At dawn, I passed the imperial palace. Here, at the hot springs, the emperor entertains his court and music echoes round the hills. Only the rich and powerful may bathe here. But the silk they wear was woven by poor people, women whose husbands are beaten for their taxes. The halls are full of ladies as fair as goddesses, the scent of perfume moves with each captivating figure, clothed in warm furs of sable, entertained with the finest music, pipes and strings, fed with camel hump soup, and oranges ripened in the frost. Behind those red lacquered gates, wine is left to sour and meat to rot. Outside the gates, lie the bones of the frozen and the starved. When I got home, there was wailing in the house. <laughs> My infant child had died of hunger. Why should I hold back my grief when even the neighbors in the village are crying for us? I'm ashamed of being a father. <laughs> So poor that I caused my son to die for lack of food. How could I know that the autumn harvest still couldn't save the poor from disaster? And I'm one of the privileged. If my life is so bitter, how much worse is the life of the common people? So... I mean, he wrote poems, a huge variety of poems, and some of them were funny. I mean, he wrote poems about, you know, planting lettuces and failing for them to sprout, or, you know, cold noodle soup. It's a wonderful poem about the taste and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, building a fence, building a thatched cottage, um, encountering a deer at the end of his garden and recognizing the kinship with other animals, um, sustainable farming, looking at uh, the, the eggs of fish on a market store. He wrote about everything, along with the great cosmic visions of humanity. But um, uh, the war poems are a, are a powerful part of it. Uh, and, uh, and I found, and I tried in the book, perhaps unwisely, because I'm not a sinologist, of course, to compare with, uh, you know, the European poets, for instance, in First World War. Um, you know, Fro Freud wrote this famous article in 1915 on mourning and melancholia. And it's right at the moment when people realize that the ideals and the value system of the West, that, that everything has been devastated by this futile and cruel war. And, and Freud 
uh, obviously searching his own interior landscape, as it were, um, says that it's, it, it's, it's, you can mourn for an ideal of civilization as powerfully as you can for somebody close to you that you love. The sense of loss can be as huge. And, uh, and, and that's what Dufu eventually, eventually works to. Just a very short poem about, to, to underline that. He, um, some of his most famous poems were written at this time. And, uh, and he wrote one poem called Spring Sea. And by now the capital has fallen to the rebels. And vast numbers of people are dead. The imperial family has fled. The palaces are deserted and boarded up in the serpentine. And one day he goes furtively, he says, uh, for a walk past the, the palaces. And, and spring scene, the title of the poem, if you're Chinese, spring is the blossom and the, you know, the vision of the, the beauty of nature and all that. And he's going through the devastated capital where, and, and this is the poem. And, and the opening line is perhaps the most famous, or one of the most famous in Chinese literature, Guo Po Shan Du Zai. The state is destroyed, but the country remains. In the city, in spring, grass and weeds grow everywhere. Grieving for the times, even the blossom sheds tears. Hating the separation, birds startle the heart. The beacon fires have been burning for three months now. A letter from home would be worth 10,000 in gold. And scratching my head, my white hair's getting thinner. Soon it won't hold a hairpin. Great piece of doofu going from the, the huge picture to the, the very close picture. And uh, um, so those war poems are absolutely ingrained in Chinese imagination. Uh, there's a, you can see online, there's a wonderful piece on YouTube of, an, of, a, chi, of a Chinese American who was a child during the Japanese uh, invasion and describes how he saw that line from Dufu, the state is destroyed but the country remains, daubed over the great burning building in his hometown, destroyed by the Japanese. You know, he says, I, when he, he'd been asked in the poetry group to read a poem and he said, I didn't choose the poem, it, it chose me. So uh, these are very, very powerful things that have remained in the Chinese tradition for that long. So that's the war poems. Great. Um, I think you've already begun to answer this question, but I'm just going to push you a little bit more. Because it, it sounds like a little bit you're going to say that Du Fu chose you. The question is, why Du Fu? So as you mentioned, you know, Li Bai, you know, there are many other yeah. tremendous poets. Yeah. Uh, in China. Mm. Why specifically do... Yeah. There are many, many great poets in China. Women too. Uh, I said to the Chinese friends recently who might have access to Dosh, if, uh, you know, I'd love to do a film about Li Qing Zhao, the great uh, uh, woman poet of the 12th century. But why do Fu? Well, it's, a, it's a, one of those funny stories, and I, I actually say quite openly in the book, I'm sure if you all, we all love literature in this room, don't we? And if you love literature, you will have had that moment when you open a book that opens a window on a world that you never even dreamed existed. And, and that's what happened to me. I was at school here in Manchester, and then I went into Sheraton Hughes's bookshop in Cross Street, and there was the new Penguin classic of late Tang poems. And I opened it, and Dufu begins it with autumn wastes and you look at it and you it, it, you didn't imagine anything like that that didn't come into your ken beforehand and I loved Shakespeare and acted in Shakespeare and all that and, and uh, of course it's a very different kind of poetry um, and uh, very different kind of poetry I mean Dufu is somebody who you, you know exactly what he's feeling. And he's, he's recording the feelings of somebody who, from the 8th century in incredible detail. His, his foibles, his amour propre, his defeated ambition, his, you know, you name it, his sympathy for humanity, 
his love of the natural world, his Zen Buddhist, because he was interested in Zen Buddhism, conception of the universe and humanity as a vast cycle. Um, uh, and, but he wrote about what he felt. If he, if he goes out into the garden and the lettuces haven't sprouted and there's only weeds have taken over, he, he writes a poem about that. You know. So you really know what he feels about. Shakespeare, of course he's a dramatic poet, but although he writes sonnets, is completely inscrutable. <laughs> you can't, nobody could say what Shakespeare felt about anything, probably. Certain things, <laughs> maybe, you could cleverly <coughs> extrapolate. But whereas Dufour, it's like that. And I found that really great. And actually, kind of fascinated by him in, you know, in a casual way over the years, and reading different translations of him, and even asking Chinese friends, well, to, read me this in Chinese, let me just, you know. But then when we did the Story of China films, we, we did a sequence on Du Fu, and then um, I thought, well, let's try and do this, and, and did the journey just on the very eve of COVID, literally three weeks before COVID started in China. And we put the film out in, um, in the first year of lockdown with Sir Ian McKellen doing the readings, mm. which was great. And we've been slightly iffy about um, cultural appropriation these days. The BBC and other channels, quite rightly, I guess, can be quite difficult about non-Chinese person reading Chinese poetry. But the funny thing was, when it went out on terrestrial in China, on CCTV, the audience reaction was overwhelmingly, it was fantastic. And he looks exactly like Du Fu. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, you know, so, so it's a long, so the book really is a kind of labor of love. And uh, um, it is slightly travelogy. Can I read you a tiny bit of travelogue? Yes. Is that all right? I'm, like I'm, I'm being I'm a bit doing. wayward here. Pete, and leading you astray from your plan, aren't I? No, um, no, not at all. Um, uh, if you could read a little bit of the travelogue, I have then a question okay. about it. Okay, um, it begins. My quixotic adventure to trace Dufu's steps began in the rain at his family home near the old eastern capital of Luoyang. And on that first day, I had misgivings that my romantic enterprise might be misguided. I stayed in Gongyi, typical provincial city, blocks of flats, light industry, desultory ring roads full of car repair shops, truck stops, and road houses serving basic Hernan food. Having dumped my bags, I consoled myself that whatever the ongoing destructions of modernity, the landscape remains, as Dufu himself put it. For out there was the first glimpse of the setting of his old home. From my top floor room at the Huayu Business Hotel, I could see over the townscape and the Luo River to a rain-sodden reef of green hills stretching out to the Yellow River at its confluence with the Luo. The scene was overlooked by a steep hill topped by a fairy tale pagoda, which now and then teasingly appeared and then disappeared in flurries of rain and cloud, holding out the promise that somehow like a river under the ice, running below the surface, the past might, as if by magic, still rise. And if you're making films, of course, that's the moment when the picture goes wibble, wobble, wibble, wobble, and the story begins, you know. But, uh, you know, we, we, old, we old media hacks use the same old gags, you know. But anyway, that's the, that's the beginning of the travelogue, which kind of, Goes through, and with some very nice and touching interviews with ordinary Chinese people at the big tourist spots, you know. You can tell the, um, the travelogue itself gets quite poetic. <laughs> um, but it's really, in a way, three books in one. And I think you've already had a taste of all three elements to it. You know, one is you get um, Du Fu in translation directly. So for those of us who weren't familiar with his poetry, it's a great introduction to his poetry. Of course, it's also a travelogue, as we just heard. Um, but then we also get essentially a biography of Du Fu in the process. Um, so my question for you is, how did you come up with this idea of essentially three books in one, of, of merging uh, these three different, usually separate genres, mm. um, to create what ends up, in my view, 
being a very intimate and personal mm. uh, account of, of your engagement uh, with Dufu and your engagement with China. Mm. Another thing I haven't mentioned, for those of you who haven't seen the book, it's full of beautiful illustrations, both maps and, and images of the different places that Dufu traveled to and that Michael followed him to. So you get a sense of place that also grounds the narrative. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so where did the idea come from? Because from my experience, it's extremely novel. Well, it, as I said, we old media hacks <laughs> reproduce our, our old tricks, don't we? And I, I've made quite a few films over the years with uh, journey films. And sometimes we've, we've handled really big historical themes like the Spanish conquest of the New World, for instance, one of the best series we ever made, was, which went to most countries on the, the conquistadors. The focus of each of the films was a journey, Cortes to Mexico, Pizarro in Peru, Oriana in Amazonia, Cabeza de Vaca across Southern America, the uh, United States of America. A journey is a very good format for telling a story. And, um, and on, on one level, that's, that's the reason. But of course, it wouldn't be possible were it not for the fact that Dufu's own life, from the moment his world collapsed, he sets off on a journey. He, in the end, he, um, he gives up on any hope of having preferment in the capital and the imperial family. He gets his family together and his kids, and they have a cart, and his favorite old horse that he writes a wonderful poem about my, my dear old horse. You've been with us for so long. You've been so patient. You know, gorgeous poem about his horse. And they set off like one of those World War II epics. You know, like, do you remember the silver sword? You know, families desperately trekking away from the disasters of, on the Russian front to escape. And, he, and they travel westwards and they then travel they, they try and hang out in the valleys around Qingzhou and the you know, borders of Gansu for a winter, but it's so terrible when the war comes there. And then they go over the mountains into Sichuan uh, and nearly starve to death and they get terrifying ordeals, all of which he writes poetry about. They take refuge in, um, in Chengdu for, for quite a while, a couple of years or so. He borrows land and builds a thatched cottage himself, like most Chinese gentlemen. He was quite good at practical things, planting things, harvesting things. Um, but the, it's a family living on the edge of starvation. And, and, uh, and then they're driven on by the Tibetan invasion of Chengdu, and he goes down the gorges, the Yangtze gorges, um, by, uh, in a little boat, still with his family and his kids, although hand-to-mouth existence, begging, um, cadging off people. And they spend a couple of years living in the Yangtze Gorges. And actually, what, this is one of the things that I tried to do is that, as you will know, the Three Gorges Dam has destroyed the landscape of the Yangtze Gorges. The water's 500 feet deeper than it was in Dufu's day. But uh, I searched out the wonderful uh, hand-tinted photographs from 100 years ago, some of them 150 years ago, uh, to show the, what the landscape was like when he lived there. Uh, so you can actually have a caption which says, Dufu's cottage was up on the right-hand side behind the pagoda, you know, or, um, or even the, the, the fisherman, he, these beautiful poems about the, uh, you know, the fisherman's songs echoing over the gorges, and, and you've got these. So um, uh, that, that helped bring to everybody's imagination what he actually saw. I mean... The, the 400 poems he wrote in the Yangtze Gorges are, by general consent, the greatest that he wrote. And in the book, I've tentatively offered this suggestion that maybe with really great artists like Shakespeare and other writers, but even possibly musicians um, like Bach and Beethoven, um, towards the, the end of your life, your mastery of your medium is so great that you almost depart from the normal syntactical relations and graphical connections and, and go into a, a world which is very taxing for the reader but is, you know, brilliant. Uh, and, uh, and I made comparisons there with some Western writers. But the gorges are, are, are 
he obviously loved the gorges and many of the poems he was a night walker which a number of great writers are in the literary history where you you, you stay awake at night and you you're watching the changing color in the sky as dawn comes and the snow on the mountains and and uh, some of these he rents a room in a uh, on the the battlements of Quezo uh, where the, the the family's staying up in the hills nearby and this for example is uh, called a night in the tower where he's he stayed rather than going home he stayed in the town and he's watching this great river of stars. Um, in Zen Buddhism and in Chinese mythology, the, the river of stars, visible in the currents of the river, becomes this vast circulatory system of life in which humankind just have their, their own part. And this is the poem. In the, <clears throat> in the evening of the year, yin and yang hurry the shortening daylight. On the sky's edge, frost and snow, clear in the cold of night. Drums and horns of the fifth watch give notes both strong and sad. In the three gorges, the river of stars, reflections stirring, shaking, weeping in the wilderness. How many families know of war and loss? The people's songs rise from the fishermen and the woodcutters. The tales of sleeping dragon and leaping horse, the old heroes who have turned to dust. All word of events in the human world lost in these vast silent spaces. So that's, what, that's in his Zen mode contemplating uh, the universe. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, the Gorges becomes a really, really important part of his life. And, and, and though they push on, in a desperate attempt, perhaps, still by a river, maybe hoping he could in the end get home, you know, maybe there's <coughs> something in me, he hoped he would get back to the, the old family estate, which was now overgrown and ruined um, near Luoyang. It would have been a long journey to do so, but he sails down the, the Yangtze to Lake Dongting, but uh, his health worsens, he had asthma, malaria, um, all kinds of problems. And, uh, and he dies near, uh, near Pinjiang in 770. So he wasn't yet, what's that? 712 to 770. So he wasn't yet 60, but he writes of himself as a, 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 a very old man now, is the way he feels, you know. Mm -hmm. And he died in obscurity. Um, people who encountered him and for whom he wrote occasional verse, for example, all could see that he was a truly great poet. But um, he died in obscurity. It's about a generation or so later that somebody writes a, an account of him saying, there was nobody like him since the dawn of time. He's just the greatest. And by then, only a small number of his poems had been collected together in a manuscript edition. The great, it's all before printing, of course. The first printed text that we've got that's dated is 868, so mm -hmm. a century after his, after his um, death. And then a great manuscript edition of most of his poetry was published in the um, 10th, 11th century, early 11th century, and then printed soon after. And from then on, he's tended to be seen as conscious of the country, almost. That actually leads perfectly to my next question, which is, you're not the only Dufu fan, um, and you encountered many other Dufu fans in your travels. And so my question is, why do you think Dufu is so popular in China today? Yeah. Well, as I said at the beginning, the poets are deemed to be the truth tellers in China. And you can say things in poetry that you can't in other forms of literature. And the, the, the recent demonstrations, holding up placards and speaking lines from his poetry, is, one, is just an example of, uh, of that. I, I, I talked to quite a few people at Chengdu. Chengdu is where he built a thatched cottage and lived for quite some time. And it's a very famous tourist um, spot in China. Um, maybe not the biggest place of literary pilgrimage in the world, because I guess Lu Xun uh, the, the house in uh, Shaoxing is that, you know, that's unbelievable scale. But 
But the Chengdu Thatched Cottage is the oldest great literary pilgrimage place in the world, perhaps. And it's a lot of people, a lot of people come. And I interviewed quite a few people there. And it was very jolly, you know, ordinary folk, not, not you know, upper middle class literary people, but ordinary folk who'd learned them at school. You know, three sisters had all retired and they'd come on a special trip. And, um, you know, a group of friends who'd come from all over China and had these regular meetings once a year um, to be with each other, women, and, and ask them what their favorite poems were. And, and they talk about them. And of course, everybody agrees. And they're partly mouthing what the government tells you to mouth, I think, you know, that uh, he was, uh, you know, very loyal to the state. But of course, he was loyal to the, the idea of a just state. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote savagely about the corruption of, and failures of government. But the, the Chinese state today, because they present, you, you, you learn him in school, they, um, the, the things you learn in school tend to be things that are not controversial, you know. Mm -hmm. The Li Guinyan, the meeting with the musician south of the river, and, 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 and those kind of things. Uh, the, the, they don't teach you at school with kind of sort of bitter critiques of the failure of government. But, um, but there was just a widespread love of, of, uh, of his poetry among all the people who were crowding into the, the, um, uh, the Thatched Cottage site. He wrote one or two gorgeous poems just about the landscape and everything else there, you know. We, we met a, a couple whose little daughter, she was only about six, had fallen in love with it, and she read out the, the, the oh, oh gosh, what's it called? <laughs> Warm rain, spring night or something, and it's, it's so gorgeous. You, um, have we got time for one more? Quickly, and then I have one last question before we open to the audience. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's been very patient. Yeah. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Yeah, the little girl ran, she read it out, the, 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 the little six-year-old. The good rain knows its season. When spring arrives, it brings life. It follows the wind secretly into the night and moistens all things softly, soundlessly. On the country road, the clouds are all black. On a riverboat, a single fire bright. At dawn, you see this place now red and wet. The flowers are heavy in Brocade City. So Brocade City is, is Chengdu. So it's just an observation about the feel of it. So, and the Chinese, all the people we met, you know, love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my last question um, sort of brings us back to today and the difficult times we face mm. in international affairs broadly, and that includes uh, China's relations with the West. Yeah. And um, as we discussed before uh, the event today, so much of what we hear in the media um, is about conflicts between China and the world, whether it comes to the security <coughs> realm or economics or trade. And so this tends to produce a, a conversation about China that focuses on difference, that somehow you know, the West and China are these polar opposites. Um, one thing I really loved about this book is the way you put Du Fu in comparative perspective, as you have today discussing, for example, him in comparison to Shakespeare, Dante, other poets from the West. I was wondering if you could talk about that in terms of how it allows us to focus not on our differences, but on our similarities, mm. on common themes that poets around the world and all of us as humans confront mm. of issues from sorrow, sorrow to loss to suffering mm. to compassion. Mm. Um, to me, this is what is so valuable and so, so important about work like this is that it reminds us of our our common humanity. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, uh, reading a poet like Du Fu tells you that uh, at root we, we have a common humanity and our values are the same. And, and um, there's such an effort at the moment, for example, by uh, you know, the Chinese government to suggest that actually that there's a Chinese way and it is distinct from the Western way. Western values of, you know, Humanity, human values, liberal values, but 
but um, you know, ideas about human rights and everything else that don't pertain to China. We've always done differently. And of course, when you look at the, the great productions of China, they, 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 there are many, many things in common. You know, um, even you could look today and say it's uncanny the way the Communist Party have replicated the structures of governance that the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty had. You know, an authoritarian bureaucracy. You know, that's what they've done. But it needn't always have been like that, and it wasn't always like that. And people in the 17th century were, were arguing about um, uh, a more open society. And the rule of law. You know, there's a great book written in the 17th century on, on why we've got to have the rule of law. So it, it, it's diminishing China's incredible achievements to suggest that somehow it's, uh, uh, it's on this one path. And of course, the great literary figures just tell you that it's not. You know, and that's, that's what I'm, I, I love about Dooku. But, uh, you know, having traveled with him, I, I just l love him as a person. He's just, he's just really frustrating and all the rest. But he's, it's, so, it's so touching. And, and the effort he makes to tell you how he feels. Has anybody in the whole of history before the 8th century ever given such an account of themselves, an, an, an interior um, portrait? Uh, and I don't think they have, I can't think of any, anybody who, who has, you know, and, and uh, so that's wonderful. Um, I mean, in, in my academic work, I, I'm quite interested in eight, great 8th century scholars in the West, like Alcuin, and actually Alcuin is, uh, you know, writes very tender poetry about uh, his, love for, his love for his male friends, and, and he, he's, they're very, very touching documents. It's quite interesting to compare uh, uh, eighth century scholars, exact contemporaries, um, but Dufu's portrait of his his own life and feelings is on a, a completely different level. You know. But then China itself was on a completely different level. Um, A. C. Graham, in his book on the Tang poetry, says you know that, that there are these moments in the history of poetry where things really obviously change in a very short time, and the poetry becomes much denser, much richer, more self-reflexive. Um, 16th century England is a classic case where the poetry just changes and, and suddenly you give birth to Shakespeare. You could argue it doesn't really happen in France until the 19th century, but in China it happens in the 8th century. And, uh, and Dufu is the, the first great example of that. And, and of course he shapes the poetic tradition from then on. F fantastically influential on everybody else, uh, especially in times of war and destruction.